welcome. Thank you for joining us today, wherever you may be joining us. If you're just jumping on, we're so glad to have you today. I get that it's a holiday weekend, uh, but hopefully for those of you that are here in town or you're a part of Antioch West to uh, whatever degree you're able to be a part, whether it's here physically or maybe you're one of the one of our virtual members, uh, that you will be able to join us in a group today if you're able to and, and being in town. I'm so thankful for the ability to live stream and, and what that affords us to do, especially on a day like to this where so many may be doing many different things and we're scattered and we're able to come together uh, and watch together. And that's awesome. But the live stream is a tool. It's simply that. It's, it's only a tool. It can't substitute us coming together and connecting as the body of Christ. And I know some can't do that physically because, you know, distance uh, uh, keeps you and in, 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 uh, in, in inhibits you from being able to do that. But the Lord's grace is sufficient in those situations, and we're thankful for that. But for those of us that are able to, there's nothing that can substitute us coming together as the body of Christ. And so uh, today, I'm thankful for live stream, especially again, like a holiday weekend. It's very difficult and very, uh, very just kind of chaotic um, to have this opportunity. But again, just remind you that all this is a tool. It can't substitute the power of agreeing together, coming together, um, and having ourselves connected in the body of Christ. So uh, glad you could join us. I don't say that you should now turn, us, turn this off and go on to something else. But just to remind you again, for those of you that are part of Antioch West, Let's never forget that what we're doing here is not a substitute for anything. And it's not a cop-out to make it easier or convenient. It's an opportunity to use a tool that's available to us, live streaming, so that we can maximize our ability to reach as many as we can, but also maximize our ability to connect in as many ways as we can as the body of Christ. And so as we continue to follow God and he leads and guides us, and that could change next week. It could change. Um, and it's, it's an ever evolving tale as we are led by the Lord and he directs our path. But uh, let's never forget the purpose for all this, the reason for all this. And we are the body of Christ. We're the church, not defined by a building or a location, but we're the church defined by a group of people and the I like the biblical word, the word church, not to get into this, but the word church not being in the Bible, uh, in the original Bible, the word church translated from the word ecclesia, which means a gathering of the called out ones, the, a gathering of, of people. And so we are truly, he said, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. That's he will build my gathering of people that I'm gathering together. And I want to be a part of Jesus's group, man. I want to be a I want to be a part of Jesus's group. I want to I want to be a part of his body. And wherever that is, wherever that happens, that's what I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a part of, well, this particular church or that particular church or this group or that group. I want to be a part of Jesus's group. So wherever Jesus is going, that's where I want to go. Praise God. If you're just joining us and you uh, or haven't been with us now for the last, oh, it's been a couple of months, especially with the holidays and different things we've missed here. So we're We've been doing this now for a little while. We are uh, kind of just continuing to plow through here um, as we are directed of the Lord on our uh, Fruit Matters series. We are in uh, week six. And again, uh, if you're not familiar with this, we are offering a free set of companion notes that you can get uh, as no charge. You can get those. In fact, I'll put up the link here now. If you would just email Antioch West at myantioch.org and just request the notes, you can get those if you choose to do that. PDF form. Now, if you're a part of one of our small groups and you're able to attend today, you can uh, receive an actual uh, physical copy of those uh, notes as well. If you choose to do that, some don't like the PDF. Some actually still want the old pen and paper. Um, so that's available to you. However, if you're not able to do that and you still want a copy of today's notes for you to take, again, these are not, uh, it's not a how-to guide. It's simply a companion piece for you to take, to take home or to use 
uh, in your own journey with Jesus. If you'd like to do that, you can just right there on the bottom of the screen, Antioch West at myantioch.org. And you can receive a free copy of those uh, today in digital form. Uh, but we're moving into week uh, six here. And um, I want you to kind of pay attention for a moment this morning because it's going to seem like we're changing course, but we're not. Um, because there's something to all this that we need to be reminded of and uh, something that we need to make sure that we don't forget in this entire journey that we're on that God has led us on when it comes to um, uh, our spiritual fruit that we are trying to exhibit. We want to we wanna bear fruit, right? Because the title of all of this is Fruit Matters. And Jesus said it, you shall know them by their fruit. And uh, especially for those of us that have come uh, have been around for a long time. Um, we have, we have, we've allowed God to start to change and modify our definition of what fruit is because for us, for a lot of us, fruit would be determined by our works, right? How many, you know, our ministry, how many people that we're leading to Jesus or what classes we're teaching or what, you know, what, where are we ministering? What title we have? And that's not fruit at all. And so we are on a quest here we're on a path to define what does jesus say fruit is and what does it mean to have fruit in my life and if i don't have these things working in my life i'm not bearing fruit and if i'm not bearing fruit that means i'm not connected to jesus right and i'm going to be judged by my fruit i'm not going to be judged by the works that i do necessarily even though following the will of God and doing his will and being a part of the kingdom of God is a part of it. I'm not diminishing that, but we shall be known by our fruit. And I believe part of it, and I'm not to get into this again, because I've covered it now in previous weeks. But again, this is to get into this whole point is that the, the, the contradiction of most, uh, most people as they see Christians is they see Christians doing works that represent Christ, but not bearing fruit that represents Christ. And so it's conflicting in what they see because they see us doing things in the name of Christ, but not acting like or exhibiting the character of Christ. To be honest with you, if we're going to choose one or the other, let's choose the character of Christ and let's let the work of Christ be done as he leads. So we're flipping the switch here. We're, flip, we're flipping the dynamic here. I want to be Christ-like. I, I want to exhibit the character of Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And as he leads me, I will do what he asked me to do, and I will be a part of his kingdom. But that's not the goal. That's not the desire, right? They said these are ignorant and unlearned men, but we recognize that they have been with Jesus. It wasn't necessarily what they were doing that caught the attention of those that were seeing the early uh, disciples of Jesus. It was the fact that they were exhibiting Jesus. They were dripping with Jesus, if you want to call it that. They were just encased and encompassed with the power of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. And, the, and how do I know that's happening in my life? There are measurements. There, there's, there's fruit that should come from that, right? And, and I could use many different illustrations to that. Uh, but um, if you were on a diet today, if you chose, you know what, I would, like to, I would like to get on a diet. Many of you may or may not be doing this, but uh, we, I was just talking to uh, uh, one of the uh, men in Antioch West last Sunday at our gathering, and uh, he's lost 60 pounds, which is absolutely amazing. It was just awesome um, and just a, what a great great achievement and we were just chatting about that and you know and the fruit of his, of what he's doing is the fact that there is there is uh, 60 pounds he's lost and and what an awesome awesome achievement but let's be honest if if that man said hey listen I'm dieting I'm 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 dieting and he's gained 60 pounds you would say mm, something's off here right why because the fruit of your a fruit of what you're saying is not adding up. And so that's a silly illustration. I hate to use certain illustrations because I feel like it always, you know, ruffles somebody's feathers. That's not my intent. My point is making is that if I'm doing something 
There should be fruit that comes from that. And it's the same thing with my Christ-like transformation. If I am being transformed into the image of Christ, then ultimately there should be fruit that accompanies that. And then we've got to define what that fruit is. That fruit is not church attendance. It's not, well, I'm going, I'm coming to church and I'm, I'm, I'm paying my tithes and, and, and I hate to say this, I'm following the rules. I'll leave it at that. That's not fruit. That might be conformity and it might be in some ways sincere obedience, but sincere obedience and conformity is not fruit bearing. And that's why we started all of this with John 15. If you abide in me and I abide in you, then you shall bear fruit. And so we're kind of changing a lot of this. Those of you that have been around Antioch West, it kind of feels like in some ways akin to uh, Anatomy of a Disciple. If you remember that series we did back in 2018, where we sort of redefined what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? I'm hoping in Jesus' name that this is having the same effect for those of you that are a part of us in this journey is that once we start defining fruit, um, it starts to change uh, our desires. Instead of desiring to do for Christ, we desire to be like Christ because the fruit that we used to use was stuff that we do for Christ. Look what I did for Jesus. Well, that's great, but unfortunately, you can do a lot of things for Christ and not exhibit the character, the nature of Christ. And so that's what we're trying to do. But here's the point. Now, we might, we're going to get to this at the end because obviously, if you've been following along, we've been, we, we're using the fruit of the Spirit as listed by Paul in Galatians chapter 5. But we're going to sort of dive into this a little more because here, here's here's part of the problem I believe some of us are having. And this is sort of the issue. And just to sort of help you along for those of you that are sincerely asking God for this to be a part of your life, hopefully in Jesus name, I'm going to help you here or the Lord's going to help you here over the next few minutes because so here, here's the problem with all this, right? We've been talking a lot about love the last couple of, of weeks. Uh, the last, in fact, the last, uh, I believe it's the last four, maybe we got four sessions on love in, and, um, we looked at love from sort of a lot of different angles, which is important, but here's the real big part of all this. Let's, let's, let's take a step back because I feel like, and I'm going to get to this in a moment, why I believe the Lord directed us to go in this direction today, because I think this is addressing something on a bigger scale because if you look at the list and you have nine fruits of the spirit listed in uh, Galatians chapter five, we started with love. And if you know anything about the list, the next, the list, the next on the list is joy. So I've never taught, to be honest with you, never taught the fruit of the spirit at all. I have touched on it. I've used it. I have mentioned it, but I've never, never attempted to teach it in its fullness to go through it and teach it and so if you look at the fruit of the spirit it's nine of them and so the 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 simple approach would be let's just go through the nine fruits of the spirit let's define them let's look at them so we talk about love let's go to joy then we'll go to peace and then we'll just work our way down the list and we'll finish at the end with self-control and then we'll call it a We'll, we'll put a put a cherry on the top of it, and we say, okay, we've taught about the fruit, the, the the fruit of the spirit. But here's the problem with that approach. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it does have some flaws to it. And the flaws about it is, it's that this is not about defining what each fruit is. Now we could do that. And I'm going to say, I don't necessarily think there's anything fundamentally wrong with defining what each fruit is. Okay. Love equals this. Joy equals this. Peace equals this. Long suffering patience is this. Uh, kindness. We could do all that and, and, and we could define them and we could share, you know, we could share, okay, the, this is the, but here's the problem with this. And let's step back for a second. Let's look at a couple of key factors to all of this, because ultimately this is what it's about, right? This is about bearing fruit because fruit matters. It's not really about defining each fruit. 
as if we're walking through the grocery store and we're looking at the produce section and we go, okay, that's a banana because it's yellow and it's got a peel on it. Okay, that's an orange because it's orange and it's citrusy and that's a lemon because it's yellow and that's a red apple, that's a green apple, that's red grapes, green grapes. You know, we're not walking through God's produce section giving you a tour of all the different fruits as if you can select each one and say, okay, Boy, I'd like that today or like this, because there's two defining things here that we have to remember for those of you that are sincerely, and I I know if you're not, and I don't mean that to be negative, if you're just here to put in your time, I've already lost you, you're zoned out, or you're probably doing something else and distracted. But for those of you that are saying, okay, Lord, I want this a part of my life, I, I wanna challenge you for a second to step back for a moment, because to continue on and just define each term, is really fruitless. I want to use that term. It really won't bear fruit. It will be fruitless. Yeah, you'll be intellectually stimulated because you'll go, oh, wow, that's a great definition. Or, okay, I understand what that means. And, you know, let's define goodness. Let's define uh, faithfulness, gentleness. You know, okay, self-control. Okay, I kind of got that. That's pretty self-explanatory. You know, love, okay. But that's not what we're trying to do because, number one, let's look at two terms here. What are we do? What are we looking at? What is the list called? What is the list of the nine items? We're, we're, what is it called? It's called the fruit of the spirit. There are two words there that jump out that we need to make sure on this journey that we're on because it also helps us. And I'm going to get to it in a minute. Why? Why maybe some of you are struggling. Because I think this is also helping us understand how God looks at all this. So the two terms that really stick out when you say the fruit of the spirit is number one, the word fruit, not fruits. It's not a plural, it's a singular, meaning that the nine items listed are not singular items, but it is a single entity called the fruit of the spirit. We're not looking at oranges and apples, we're looking at produce, if you wanna call it that way. It's not looking at the fruits of the spirit as if one of these is going to be your definition. I'm a lover. I'm a joyful person. I'm a peace. I'm a patient person. I'm a kindness. I'm a goodness. Uh, You know, I'm I'm a faithfulness. I'm gentleness. I'm self-control. As if each one of us gets to pick which fruit is our fruit. It's the fruit of the spirit, not the fruits of the spirit. The first word there is fruit. The second word is spirit. These two terms really set the stage and the foundation for the entirety of the list. So it's pointless to get into joy or peace or love or or, or patience or whatever else we want to discuss on the nine items. And actually, I believe you can actually argue there's there's also one other one you can add at least to the list because, and we, we, uh, we can read it if necessary, but the Bible talks about Uh, the kingdom of God being more than just simply uh, these, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So you could add righteousness in among that list if you chose to do so. But here's the point to all of this, is that number one, it's fruit. Second of all, it is spirit. What does that mean? That means all of this is done by the work of the spirit. So, This opens up another really topic that is important for us to define, especially for us that have been around for a long time. And whether you label yourself Pentecostal, apostolic, whatever you are, but you're someone that believes in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So whatever else you wanna label yourself, you believe in the spirit manifesting itself with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Here's what this really leads to. It means that when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, as described in John 3, John 7, and given uh, in its description in Acts 2, and later on in other places as well, but I'll just use those three, is that when you receive the Spirit of God into your life, the evidence of that Spirit being inhabiting the evidence of the spirit inhabiting you is that you begin to speak with a new tongue 
This happened on the day of Pentecost. It happened with all the disciples, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, had this experience. It happened later on when the Gentiles first received the, the message of Jesus Christ and Cornelius and his house, they began to speak with a new tongue. It happened later on in, in, in with the disciples of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. They received the same experience. It's talked about by Paul. He received the same same same. Uh, experience. In fact, Paul said, I, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So there is a, there is a truth to all this. And Jesus described in John chapter three and in John chapter seven, specifically, there's other references, but we'll use those two. John chapter three, he spoke to a man named Nicodemus. And in John chapter seven, he spoke to a crowd that was gathering at a feast and, and, and spoke of this experience that was going to be available to us when we receive the spirit of God. It is awesome if you've never received the Spirit of God with that evidence in you. So you say, well, I want to receive the Spirit of God, or I've received the Spirit of God. My question to you is, how do you know, right? Well, God in his great kindness and mercy and grace gives us evidence that, that we have received his Spirit. Right? We talked earlier, how, what's the evidence that your diet's working? You can, there's 14,000 different people out there right now. They'll tell you, do this diet, do that diet. I don't care what diet you do. What, how do you know a diet's working? Because you should be losing weight, right? That's the idea. I want to go on a diet. Why? I don't want to go on a diet because I like to gain weight. I want to go on a diet because I'd like to lose weight. So we do that, right? And how do we know if it's working? Because we start to lose. We love to see the fact that our clothes fit differently or the fact that the scale's moving, whatever your, whatever your measurement is, we know, wow, this is working because of this, right? Well, God gives us an indication that we have received his spirit because it's a supernatural uh, experience, right? It's not something that can be quantified in your mind. It's not something that can be quantified through science, but it can be, you receive it supernaturally. And the manifestation of that supernatural event is the, is the, is the, is the expression that God begins to speak through you with a new tongue. This is the evidence of the spirit of God. Here's the problem with this though, for you and I who have had this experience. I had this experience in 19, uh, in the summer of 1985. Others of you right now can go back and go, I received the spirit of God with the evidence of speaking in tongues on this date. That's awesome. Great, but how do you know that your spirit filled after that? Because if that's the, that's, we've made that, oh Lord, help me here. We've made that the ceiling, that should be the floor. Woo, I, mess, I know I'm messing right now with somebody's theology. So before you panic and call up the powers to be and say, I've lost my mind, work with me for a second. The initial evidence of speaking in tongues should be the, the floor, not the ceiling. That should be the base of my, my, my experience with the spirit of God. It should not be the, 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 the peak. Things should go from there, not stop there. And so because we have focused on that and it needs to be focused on because it is a powerful experience it's a life-changing experience and is a it, it is a let's put it this way it's a necessary experience jesus said it you unless you're born of water and of spirit you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven you can't see it or enter into the kingdom of heaven and they asked peter on they asked peter after this experience happened and they're sitting around, they're watching this and they're going, okay, this is crazy. How do we experience, what do we need to do? What, okay, you told us all of this, but what do we need to do? And Peter said, you got to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost. All that's great. I'm not diminishing any of that. I'm not saying that it's wrong and we need to stop. My point I'm trying to make is that's not the ceiling. That's not the pinnacle. That's not the top achievement. Done, over with, next. That's not what we're supposed to be. That's not the striving for. So you have, you've had that moment. If you've never had that, 
That's the starting point. That's the door. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No knife. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. I'm the door. You got to start with here. Okay, we got to start here. What's the door? The door begins with Jesus. And what did Jesus say? It's the, the entry point is water and spirit. That's, that's the entry point. Water and spirit is how you get into the door. But once you're in the door, that's not it. That's not the end. And that's the problem because most of us have been told that those things are necessary and they are I'm not debating that part of it because we've been told that's necessary. Once those things are accomplished and done, what do we do from there? And so what do we do? We keep going back to those moments. Oh, I feel the spirit of revelation. Someone needs to hear me. I hope maybe I'm just getting the revelation. Just me and Jesus are having a good time and that's okay. If that's a, I, I, there's nothing better than just feeling the revelation of God, just, just start to turn lights on in your, in your mind, in the darkness. So maybe I'm just having a good time with Jesus, but here's the problem because that's what we have, we have, we have so focused on. And yes, it's important. It's necessary, but it's the floor. It's the entry point. So I'm not suggesting we get away from focusing on that. I'm saying we can't just stop by focusing on that because here's the problem, because we have that experience and then we're like, okay, all right, I really don't want to do from here. We keep going back to those moments. Well, I got to make sure I stay forgiven and I just got to make sure every once in a while I'll just, you know, speak in tongues a little bit. Well, the problem with that is, is that Paul expands this entirety of, okay, great. You've had the experience when Paul wrote Galatians. He wasn't writing to people that have never experienced the spirit of God. He goes, okay, listen, you have this spirit of God. You've received the spirit of God, but how do you know that you're living a spirit-filled life? That's the difference because we know, man, I'm getting a bunch of theological stuff today and I don't mean to get so deep, but let's just go with it. We know, according to scripture, Jesus gave us the, Jesus gave us the, the parable of the fact that just because you receive the Holy Ghost one time, does it mean you stay filled permanently? Now, I know I just like, I, I probably lost a few of you. It's not a one and done. How do you know that? Well, let's go to a couple examples here. Well, Jesus gives an example of these, of 10 virgins. And they each had a lamp. In fact, it was really cool. We went to the Bible Museum a couple months ago. And I'd seen it before, but just when I saw it this time, it really just stood out to me because of the parable, parable of, the, of the virgins. It was the little lamps, these little lamps that these little personal lamps people carried. You'd fill them with oil and they had a like a, I guess some kind of wick. You'd burn it. And it would burn as long as the oil was in the lamp. And there are little small things. It's really, it was just cool to kind of see it in person. And you could take it and you could sit it on a little shelf and you could do things at night, whatever it might be. But they're like, you know, they're little small things that you carry around. But you had to keep them filled with oil. No oil, no light. So Jesus uses this as the metaphor to say, okay, there's 10 virgins and they all go to sleep. And when they get up the next day, I'm giving you a very, very short version of the story. Five have lamps that are still lit and five have uh, lamps that have been burned out. Meaning five made sure they had enough oil in them and five let their lights burn out. And when the bridegroom shows back up, he only takes those with filled lamps. He doesn't take them those with empty lamps. In fact, the ones with empty lamps are left out. So what does that mean for you and I today? That's a warning that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you've got a lamp. Congratulations. You've received a lamp. Remember, whoo, come on, somebody. Remember the floor. This is the floor. The initial evidence of speaking in tongues and the moment you receive the, God, if receive the Holy Ghost, that is the moment you're given that lamp. Congratulations. You're now the proud owner of this lamp. But now what do you do with it? You've got to keep that lamp filled. No lamp filled, no light, no oil, no light, no oil, no light. And so because five of those virgins decided 
we're good the way we are. It, they ran out of oil, and because they ran out of oil, they ran out of light. And when the bridegroom came, he did not judge them because they did not have a lamp. He judged them because their lamp was empty of oil and therefore no light. So what does that mean again for you and I? That means it's not good enough to have one experience with the Spirit of God. We must make sure that every day we keep our lamps full of light. How do we do that? We got to make sure they stay full of oil. What's the other example? Well, the other example is in the Old Testament, the lampstand. And I'm going to get to all this because a lot of deep metaphor. And I'm trying to just stay to the point. But the lampstand was in the uh, was in the 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 holy place before you got into the holies. The holies where the ark was, the presence of God was. Outside of that, lampstand was there. Other things were there, but the lampstand represented the spirit of God, the light, the spirit of God, and it was a job for a priest that every day he had to make sure that that lamp stayed filled with oil. That was one of the 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 miracles of Hanukkah you know the story of Hanukkah is that for eight days I believe it's eight yeah eight days the lamp stayed lit even though there was no oil in it it was miraculously lit that's why they celebrate one of the reasons they celebrate Hanukkah because it was the job of a priest to make sure that that lamp stayed filled with oil so the light burned so go back to you and I what does that mean? What does it mean to have a spirit-filled life? Wait a minute. I have a spirit filled life. I received the Holy Ghost. No, you didn't. You received the lamp. But now you got to make sure that lamp stays filled because you've got a lamp and it was lit, but now you got to make sure that oil in that lamp stays filled so that lamp keeps burning. So I'm sorry. You can, 1994, I received the Spirit of God. Congratulations. But your lamp is as dry as a bone. It's as dry as a bone. So Paul comes along and says, okay, listen, let me help you out here in case there's a little bit of confusion. I'm going to tell you if you have oil. How do you know if you have oil in your life? How do you know if you have your spirit filled? Okay, you had the initial evidence of the spirit. You received your lamp and it was originally lit on, you know, whatever day it was, October 12, 1997, whatever it might be. Or, you know, June 1st, 2004. Great. But how since then do you know if your oil is still filled? If you're living a filled, spirit-filled life? Paul comes along and says, let me give you a starting point here. Here's some measurements that determines if you're living a spirit-filled life. I'm going to call it the fruit of the spirit because it's the evidence and the fruit of a spirit-filled life. And he says, you're going to have love. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have patience. You're going to have kindness. And you're going to have uh, gentleness. You're going to have self-control. These are going to be things that are going to show you you're living a life filled with the spirit of God. No more than just simply, oh, well, I had an experience or every once in a while or maybe every day, you eco, EKOC, kickstart a Honda, uh, Rada Kawasaki, whatever you do, it's you're speaking in tongues moment. Great. How do you know that you're not, that, that is evident in your life and it's working? He says, I'm going to give you the, give you this list called the fruit of the spirit. So the whole point of that is, is that we are called to live a spirit filled life. We're not called to have an experience or an event. Frankly, I'm going to say this, and I'm probably, this is way too controversial to say online, but who, at this point, I've, I left that a long time ago. That's why I don't, I don't call myself Pentecostal. Pentecostal is, 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 is defined by an event, the day of Pentecost. I'm thankful for the day of Pentecost because the day of Pentecost was when Jesus Christ sent his spirit down to this earth and inhabited human beings. And now you and I can experience the same thing, but I'm not Pentecostal because I'm not trying to rehearse or rehash an event. I want to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to be a, I want to be like Jesus Christ. I don't want to be labeled by an event and I don't even want to be labeled by an ideology. I want to be labeled by him. Can I get a virtual amen? So what does it mean to be a spirit? What does it mean to be spirit filled? And what is that spirit filled evidence? That's what we're talking about here. But here's the other part about this. Our approach to having fruit in our life has been wrong. 
Because here's the approach, right? And this is what really kind of began to have me. And I knew, I, you know, I've, obviously I've, I, I know all this, but the Lord is kind of dealing with me over to fresh and anew because we had just come off of talking about love. And now the next, you know, item on the list is joy. And so I was like, okay, let's, you know, Lord, what, what do you want to talk about joy? And I started to try to dive into joy and say, okay, Lord, what do you, what do you want to show us here? And, I, and, and, and the Lord stopped me in that because I could sit here and define to you joy. If you, get, if you get a set of notes today, you'll notice that we define it. It's defined in there, and that's great. But it's de- defined for your, for your edification and growth. But it's not defined so that you can approach it from the intellectual definition. Because here's the problem with joy and also maybe the problem we're having in general when we started this several weeks ago. So we started this series several weeks ago. Fruit matters. Okay, we want to be fruit bearing. All right, great. So we start talking about fruit. And when that happens for a lot of you, guess what? You didn't just go, man, all of a sudden you and Jesus, you're tight. Things are great. All of a sudden out of nowhere, you started dealing with all kinds of junk. Stuff coming out of you that hadn't come out of you in years. Problems you're dealing with you haven't dealt with in years. Stuff in you that just like, just attitudes and feelings and frustrations and words and memories and all kinds of stuff all of a sudden start coming out of you and you're like man I was I I thought we were talking about bearing fruit and I'm a mess that's the problem we've approached fruit kind of like ordering off the menu at Starbucks right and that's how we've approached it you roll up to Starbucks today and you uh, walk up to the counter and you order your favorite, um, you know, venti caramel latte, black coffee instead of espresso. Give me six pumps of caramel and five pumps of, you know, uh, whatever else and three pumps of uh, cinnamon and, you know, give me a pump of butter pecan and a pump of amaretto and you've got this wonderful mixed drink and it's wonderful and you love it. And we've taken that same approach to a spirit-filled life. We, we are standing there looking at this menu and we go, okay, all right. Hmm, let me see what I'd like today. Let me see here. Can I get, uh, uh, let me get a spirit, oh, uh, hold on a second. Let me get a grande spiritual fruit cappuccino. Uh, give me, um, oh, uh, five pumps of love, three pumps of joy, two pumps of peace, uh, one pump of um, gentleness, uh, oh, two pumps of patience today. It's going to be a long one. Um, uh, you could, you could probably throw in three pumps of peace. That would be good. And do me a favor. Would you, could you substitute self-control with blessings and abundance? Don't leave self-control out of there. It gives a bitter taste. I don't like that. I like some more abundance and blessing. And then you have, okay, but it comes later. And then order for Joel, one spiritual fruit frappuccino. Here you go. And you're like, oh, this is great. So I come to God, I'm like, boom, I got this. All right, I got it. Here's what we're going to do. Okay, God, I need joy in my life. God, I want, I want to experience joy. Give me joy. Or how about this, right? We started with love. And you're like, okay, love. All right, I'm supposed to have fruit of the spirit, love. Oh, God, teach me to love. I want to love. Love like you. Guess what happens? Well, can you love? Let's look at this list, right? Can you love without gentleness and meekness? Can you love and exhibit love, show love without gentleness and meekness? So all of a sudden over here, God, you want to love, but then God's working over here in meekness and humility and kind of bringing a humility to you. Wait a minute. I want to talk about love. God's like, yeah, we're all talking about love. We're over here too, because you can't separate love and meekness and gentleness. So then we go into the, we go into let's, oh, okay, fine. Let's go to joy. Okay. Okay. Let's go to joy. I need joy in my life. I want joy. All right, great. But can you have joy without peace? Can you have joy without righteousness? Can you have joy without patience? 
Because let's look at a couple of scriptures here as evidence of what I'm saying here today. And I'm, I want you to change your approach because you're getting frustrated because you're searching for things and doesn't seem like God's on the same page because you're trying to focus over here and God's messing with you over here. And you're like, time out. I want to focus over here. For example, one of the things I've ever uh, you, I've, I've, I've used before in the same category is like, oh God, increase my faith. Or you prayed something along that line. Whether God increase my faith or God give me great faith or I want to be a woman or man of faith, whatever it might be. Do we expect God to strike us with some kind of like zap of faith? I need faith. Oh, yes, that's it. What, do you, what happened? God's given me faith. You know what happens when you pray for that? What, what, what does God do? Okay, you want more faith? I'm going to put you in a situation that's going to cause you to have to increase your faith. Oh God, give me, give me faith. Give me faith. Lord, I want to have great faith. God's like, I can handle that. You go to the mail the next day, you open up the mail, you look at that one envelope, you go, hmm, that's kind of strange. You're wondering where that's from. You open it up and that bill just hits you in the face that you weren't expecting. You're like, Oh God, oh, this is terrible. God, what are you doing? You don't love me. I can't deal with this. And God said, time out. I thought you said you wanted greater faith. How do you think you're going to get great faith? That's like a walking into the gym and going, I'd like to be strong. I want to be strong. Okay, lift these weights. Oh no. Oh, I haven't come to lift anything. I want to be strong. Yeah, but in order to be strong, you got to lift things that are that you can't lift. You got to lift things till you can't lift anymore. And when you do that, you're going to get stronger. Yeah, but I don't really want to do that. That's a, you know, that sounds that's like a lot of work. That's just a lot. Can I just be strong without having to do that? Doesn't work that way. Can I have great faith? No, you can't have great faith without great difficulty, trials, circumstances. So it's like, okay, Lord, give joy. I want joy. I want joy. Lord, I, I need your joy. Well, can you have joy without contentment? Because joy is, is the diff, one of the greatest definitions between happiness and joy and the determinant factor between happiness and joy is happiness is determined by our external where joy is dependent on our internal. And therefore, joy is works no matter what external circumstances are in my life. Joy is de is independent of my circumstances. Happiness is dependent upon my circumstances. So I'm happy if things are going well. I'm happy if I get that new car. I'm happy if I get that new outfit. I'm happy if I get those new shoes. I'm happy if I get that raise. I'm happy if I get that new house. But we know how it works. Those moments only come in a moment and then it starts to decrease and then we look for the next thing that makes us happy. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength because it is sustaining it's, 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 it continues because it's not based on external. It's not dependent upon external. It's independent of external. And therefore I can have joy no matter what my circumstances. I can have the joy in the midst of the most difficult trials because the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's carrying me. But how do I get joy? Well, I can't get joy without contentment. I can't get joy without peace. I can't get joy without righteousness. I can't get joy without patience. So when we get into this, we get into this list now. And I'm like, okay, let's go down the list. Okay, we did love, let's do joy. Okay, how do I get joy? Well, can you have joy without starting to look at the other things that are de that joy is working with? So you say, okay, God, I need joy. I want joy. The Lord is my strength. God, give me joy. And God's over here working on your peace. He's working on your patience. He's working on contentment. You're like, time out. I didn't ask for any of this. Yes, you did. You wanted joy. But I want I want joy. Yeah, but I but in order for you to get joy, you've got to have peace. That's why for all of us in here today, we can't really compare ourselves among ourselves because our path or our joy, let's just use joy. Our joy journey is going to be different because God is going to deal with you and your patience. The person next to you, he's going to deal with them with, uh, with their peace and the, the person, someone like me, they might say, okay, God's going to deal with me in contentment because I can't have joy if I'm not content. Paul said it. 
Paul said, Philippians chapter four, he says, I don't speak because I have need for I've learned whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to face humble circumstances and I know how to have abundance everywhere in all things. I have learned the secret both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Notice that that verse there, we quote Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It's not talking about your achievements athletically on the job, career, dream. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Give me that raise. Give me the, give me that promotion. No, it's talking about, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, meaning I can live in any situation, whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley, whether if I'm broke or I'm rich, whether I got a full plate or an empty plate, I can do all of this through Christ that gives me strength because I am content. We talked about this last Sunday for those of you that are there. We're, we're there Sunday. Contentment is impossible if you don't acknowledge that you're not your own, you don't belong to you, and that God is in charge and is in control of your life. And if there's something happening in your life, he's allowing it. So contentment comes from knowing that he is your source because your source is going to determine the outcome. If your source is possessions, if your source is money, then you're going to, you're going to be chasing that and you're going to have those moments of happiness to be followed by long seasons of frustration until you get that next happiness moment, the next vacation, the next raise, that next, next car, whatever it is, next outfit. But if Jesus Christ is your source, you can be content. And if you have contentment, you can have peace. And if you can have peace, you can have joy and joy is strength. So if you say, well, what talk about joy, let's talk about joy. Okay. Let's talk about joy. What is joy? Well, joy is strength. Joy is this is defined. If you want to get in the pure definition of it, the Greek word translated joy is chara. There's actually eight different Greek words translated joy, but the one we are familiar with is chara. And it means simply the definition means uh, joy, calm, delight, or inner gladness. Notice that calm. Well, can you be calm without contentment or patient or, or, or contentment or peace? And if joy is, is, is a companion to calmness, we well, have to have peace. You have to have contentment. You have to have righteousness. You understand how all this works. That's why Paul said it's the fruit of the spirit, not the fruits. Because Paul's saying, if you want this stuff in your life, it's not going to come because you just choose one off the shelf and say, I'd like that today. That's why the Bible says in John, when the spirit of, when the spirit comes, John labeled it the spirit of truth. But when the spirit comes, it will lead and guide you into all truth. You can't do this because let's be honest. Let's say you want to joy today. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? Because ultimately, can you have, let's put it this way. Can you have joy without giving up control? Because if you're, if you don't give up control, you can't have peace. If you're not giving up control, you can't have contentment. And if you don't have peace or contentment, you don't have calm. And if you have no calm, you don't really have the pure definition of joy. Joy is the evidence and the, and the, and the, the, the culmination of peace and, 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 and contentment, and patience and love and all these things mixed together produces joy because it's an inner gladness, not dependent upon my circumstances. Paul could have joy in prison. Paul could have joy uh, when he was laying uh, uh, broken and beaten and bloody and naked, he had joy because he had peace, he had contentment. So as we've jumped into all of this and now we're on this journey to have to be fruit bearers, we want to have, because fruit matters, okay, then why does it seem like our worlds are in chaos? Why are we dealing with all this stuff? Why, are, why is God bringing up all this stuff? Because don't forget, we talked about this, I think it was week one or week two, I think it was week one looked at the fig tree and said, you know, it's not bearing fruit. Let's get rid of it. And the guy said, listen, okay, let me, 
Let me dung it. Let me dig and dung it. Meaning, let's let me break up some stuff that's hard. Let me put some some fertilizer on it, and let's see if that works. Let's see if that can that will change it. And so, when you start wanting to be a fruit bearer, guess what? God starts digging you up. He starts putting junk in your life to fertilize that growth. Because he says, any of any anyone that bears fruit, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to I'm going to cut cut some things out of you so that you can bear much fruit. I said this on a podcast and I'll, I'll finish with this. I said this on one of the fully equipped podcasts that I am not in any way a, a gardener. I'm not, I enjoy working outside. I enjoy cutting grass, but I, I'm not an expert in any way. And so I have these boxwoods in the front of my house just boxwoods are just sort of these green, a green bush. And, um, I, uh, I noticed that my neighbor, his was growing so beautifully and mine just looked sad. But I noticed after observing that he was trimming his back in order to make them grow, which in a lot of ways seems counterintuitive. If I want something to grow, I shouldn't take away but it was the cutting back that produced growth. And so following, watching him, I started to prune and prune the bushes and someone else came along and was helping me in there and they pruned them as well. And now, man, these boxwoods are starting to get this wonderful, thick, full shape. They look fantastic. My wife, uh, we got, well, my wife got a, a, a holly bush we planted and now we're, we're pruning that and that's starting to grow. New sprouts is starting to grow and it's beautiful because we're pruning it. I, it doesn't make sense to me. If I want something to grow, I should make it grow, not cut back. But it's the pruning that produces growth. You want to grow and you feel like God is cutting you back. You want to grow and you feel like you're being, things are being taken away. You're being, you're being, you're being uh, 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 um, limited Wait a minute, I want to grow. Why am I not? Because you are. This is the pruning so that you can bear much fruit. We can all this fruit matters. God's view is if you want joy, I'm going to give you joy. But it's going to come with all this other stuff that I'm going to work on you on. Society's view is let's have happiness. And happiness is singular, singular, a singularity. We're going to focus only on that. Focus on what makes you happy. That's the biggest lie of all time. Don't focus on what makes you happy because you're going to be constantly chasing your tail like the dog running around in a circle because you're always going to be chasing what makes you happy because we as human beings never know what makes us happy. What makes us happy today is not going to make us happy tomorrow. That's why the Bible says it's not on the list. Not on the list. Happiness is not on the list. It's joy. Because joy is independent of anything going in my life because joy of Christ, peace, contentment, patience, peace, love, all this is to, is building joy, but you can't love truly love without peace and joy and gentleness and meekness. And you can't have patience without peace and love. And all of a sudden you start looking at this list and go, wait a minute, we can't isolate one thing. All of this is working. Because we are filled with the Spirit of God. That's ultimately it, right? We are Spirit-filled. And how do we know we're Spirit-filled? Because we are fruit bearers. Not because we're tongue talkers, but because we're fruit bearers. I'm not saying we should stop speaking in tongues. Paul said, I'm thankful that I speak in tongues more than you all. But that was the, that was the floor not the ceiling. That was the foundation, not the end point. That was the most starting point. That's not where I've come and pitched my tent and say, that's it. That gave me the lamp, but I want to keep that lamp filled every day in Jesus name. So my question to you is, are you spirit filled? What does that look like? What does it mean to be spirit filled? And can you be spirit filled and not be governed by the spirit led by the spirit? Oh, I'm spirit filled. How do you know that? Are you governed by the spirit? Do you live a life led by the spirit? 
And if not, what are the hindrances in your life that are keeping you from giving God full control? What are things in you right now that are keeping you from letting God take control of everything in your life? Because if you want joy, God's going to deal with that first. You want peace, God's going to deal with that. You want love and all these wonderful things that come with a spirit-filled life, God's going to say, well, we're going to start first with control. Who's in control? Who's in charge? Who's governing your life? Because I can't give you these things if you're in charge. We want to bear fruit because fruit matters. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. I hope all of you have a wonderful and safe Memorial Day. If you're a part of a small group, and I hope we take this, we, we, we put it, mix it with faith, apply it that God will show us a path that we can become bearers of fruit because we abide in him. Until next time, God bless you. For those of you, be a, uh, for those of you a part of Antioch West, I will see you next Sunday at Maritime, 10 a.m., and a new podcast coming your way this week. We're going to talk about this in more detail this week on the Fully Equipped Podcast. God bless you.